I'm Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix. Netflix's unique style of management. And so we have very few rules. We're on the edge of chaos. Has helped it continually reinvent itself. From scrappy upstart, posting DVDs by mail in 1997, to its stock market float. From starting streaming licensed content, then creating its own content. And left hook to the jaw. From fighting the streaming wars during the pandemic, and emerging being the only profitable major streaming service. Netflix won. Get over it. Netflix's lack of rules has kept it agile and innovative, even as it's grown to one of the largest companies in the world. However, its culture is not for everyone and has its share of critics. So this is not a sermon advocating wholesale adoption of all of Netflix's methods, but it's designed to challenge our thinking, our ways of working, and it's designed to highlight or we should be less afraid of making mistakes, as long as we can learn from them. Let's start with one of Netflix's more infamous mistakes. In September 2011, in a video apologising for an incredibly today, unpopular price increase, Reed announced something that made something the situation even worse. We think that the DVD service needs its own brand so that we can advertise it. So we've named our DVD service Quickster. Quickster? Quickster. Quickster. Really, Reed Hastings? Quickster? You seen red? And we're not talking about their envelopes. We're just talking about you being angry. Uh... Streaming was starting to take off and was clearly the future, but many members still combined streaming on their computers with watching DVDs on their TV. Having to pay for two separate memberships and use two separate websites was clearly unattractive. The move was rushed and not fully thought through. The Quickster Twitter account was still owned by a foul-mouthed, we-loving teenager. As a result, Netflix stock price dropped by 75%. However, before the move was implemented, it was scrapped. Netflix hitting rewind. The move caused an uproar with customers and now Netflix is changing course. Well, they heard the howls because now this email to subscribers that will stay as one. In other words, Quickster is dead. Afterwards, Reed took a retreat with 60 senior Netflix executives to discuss where he went wrong. He followed the sunshining principle of Netflix, where mistakes are not covered up, but are openly and widely discussed. And what I found is that our employees did not feel comfortable telling me that this was a bad idea. So we changed our culture to really focus on farming for dissent. It's each leader's responsibility to stimulate people to really say what they think might be wrong. Because learning from mistakes is so critical to the whole of Netflix's success. In fact, the culture of Netflix is based around Reed learning from the mistakes he made at his first company, Pure Software. As we grew and went public, we put in a lot of process because we had the idea if we could just eliminate errors, think how good we can be. And every time someone made a mistake, we tried to put a process in place to make sure that mistake didn't happen again. We were trying to dummy proof the system and then eventually only dummies wanted to work there. And all of the kind of innovative, crazy thinkers had gone and everybody who was still there was really good about following the rules. And of course the market shifted and the company was unable to adapt and it got acquired by our largest competitor. For a pile of money. Pile of money. Reportedly three quarters of a billion dollars. And that gave me the money to be able to start Netflix with. After the sale, Reese stayed at the new company for a few months, where he witnessed an entirely different company culture. It was so different to how they operated. The level of trust and the quality of interaction between them was impressive. That gave him a North Star something he wanted to grow towards. To make that journey, Reed brought with him his HR chief at Pure Software, Patty McCord who became the Netflix chief talent officer. Together they led the creation of the Netflix Culture Deck. It didn't come together immediately. So the Netflix Culture Deck took 10 years to write because it took 10 years to figure it out. And they didn't spend so time on the format. It's ugly as sin. I said, oh God, read it's so, the graphics. I mean, some arrows and the yin and yang. Oh. It was designed for internal use, but Reed published it on the internet and it's now been viewed more than 17 million times. The deck documented Reed and Patty's response to the mistakes they made at Pure Software. They recognized the costs of laying on process after process. I stopped and thought, and why would I have to hire people on my team to police the time that you spend on your team? They also recognized the cost of stifling innovation and disempowering talented people, causing them to leave because they weren't in a safety critical industry like medicine or nuclear power. So when Netflix made mistakes, people didn't get hurt or die. We should build a company in Netflix that tolerated some short-term chaos. And the value of that is keeping and stimulating the amazing thinkers. So when the market shifts, like DVD to streaming or license to expand to original content, we have within Netflix all kinds of original thinkers. With all this freedom, Netflix had to ensure its employees stayed aligned. This took a considerable effort to ensure that employees had the correct context to make decisions on their own. Share information broadly inside the company so people have the information they need to make great decisions 
for the company. This means managers at Netflix are expected to provide employees with everything they need to make well-informed decisions, but they will not make the choices for them. I pride myself on making as few decisions as possible in a quarter. There's sometimes I can go a whole quarter without making any decisions. And when errors or misjudgments are made, the onus is on the manager to ensure they provide better context in future. We're always trying to tease out why would a good person do something I don't seem to make sense. And so we ask, we're curious. So if your team member makes a mistake, ask yourself, are you articulate enough and inspiring enough in expressing your goals and strategy? At Netflix, the acceptance of mistakes and the focus on context, not control, allowed Reed and Patty to create radically simplified policies. We don't have a vacation policy. You take whatever you want. We don't have an expense policy. You spend as you think appropriate. We have only one five-word principle, which is to act in Netflix's best interest. So anybody at any level can purchase a new computer or sign off on a million dollar in sales deal, whatever they, whatever they need to do to get things done without getting sign offs from other people in the organization. Policies, those are just symbols that say, dear employees, we trust that you will behave like adults. And with that, we find that employees do amazing things. The policy on leave, or more accurately, the lack of policy on leave, is one of the most infamous and divisive examples of Netflix's no rules culture. And I've got genuinely mixed feelings about this. Because on one hand, I don't track the hours my team work each day. So why do I feel the need to track the number of days they work each year? If they're getting their work done, looking after themselves, why does it matter? But on the other hand, does the lack of giving employees a formal allowance of leave mean there's pressure to take less and less, and employees end up overworked? Patty's view is that the policy didn't actually change how much leave people took at all. However, it did create the culture of responsibility and ownership they were looking for. They said, Nothing's really different. It's just wonderful that I own it. So the policy of unlimited vacation is definitely not as generous as it sounds. But the lesson here isn't for all of us to suddenly rip up all our policies on leave. But it's for us to challenge, what policies do we actually need if we treat our colleagues like they are, fully formed adults? And if we can all start by removing one small policy, or one part of a policy, or one sign-off in an elongated approval process, we can see what happens, see how it works out. If it's successful, we can move forward. Because we need to take this step by step. You can't suddenly jump to a no rules culture overnight. In fact, it took Netflix 10 years to figure this out. And crucially, the conditions and the culture of the organization need to be right. Netflix inadvertently stumbled on these conditions back in 2001, when it's facing another crisis. We were gonna go public. We were drinking champagne and eating caviar, and we were gonna have $100 stock in private jets. And, um, the bubble burst and the bankers pulled the IPO and we didn't make it. Suddenly Netflix was running out of cash. The only way it could survive was to cut its expenses and quick. So Reed, Patty and the Netflix senior leadership team had divided their 120 employees into two parts. The 80 highest performers and the 40 less amazing ones that they would have to let go. We did that. It was, a, it was very difficult for us, but that Christmas, so now it's 2001, DVD players dropped to $99. If you're in the U.S., you had one under your Christmas tree, and our business went. Whoosh. Business is going crazy. We're working harder than we've ever worked. Reed and I are driving to work one day, and I'm like, I've never worked this hard in my life. He goes, me too. I'm like, I've never had this much fun in my life. And he goes, me too. So with 30% fewer employees and even more work to do than ever before, Netflix not only continued to operate, but the atmosphere improved dramatically. Because the employees they let go weren't poor performers, but they were only adequate. They required more management. They lowered the quality of conversations. They made more mistakes. And they slowed down progress. This taught Reed and Patty one of the founding principles of their culture deck. Talent density basically means instead of hiring like a, a hundred medium employees, you try to hire maybe only 10. And once you get that talent density, then you'll see so few employees, lots of talent. Then you see that performance is contagious. This principle is behind Netflix's talent philosophy. The best thing you can do for employees is to hire only A players to work alongside them. Excellent colleagues trump everything else, and therefore average performers don't fit in. Your goal is to create a high-performing team, then you can't let kind of middle performers hang around. <laughs> because if you do, it just tells your high performers that you're not really serious about creating that kind of, that kind of top work environment. The experience of the layoffs in 2001 became formalized 
into the keeper test. You imagine that each person on your team is coming to, to meet with you. So here comes Stan, for example. And Stan comes into your office and Stan says, you know, I'm sorry, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm leaving the company. Would you feel a little bit relieved <laughs> thinking about the fact that now you could focus your attention on your high performers? Stop wasting so much time on one individual? And if so, well, it's really clear that you need to make a tough decision. All this might sound unfair, but just doing this as a thought experiment for a manager gives you real insight into your team. And if you've got someone in your team that you think is not a keeper, have you told them? Are you giving them the feedback they need to improve and address those issues? If you aren't, well, that's unfair. And as an individual, it's a great question to ask a manager to get really honest, direct, and insightful feedback. If I told you I was leaving tomorrow, how hard would you try to keep me? So overall, I think the concept of the keeper test is useful but Netflix took it to the extreme. We're like a professional sports team and we want to win a championship in our area. And we're very honest with people that it's about performance. You know, you have one bad uh, game, you know, you're not out. It's a, it's a track record you build up over time. If your leadership, your manager, their manager in HR think, you know, you're unlikely to develop into the great player we need in that position, then you do get the packet. And we try to be clear about it because it's not for everyone. Pushing the culture deck in 2009 was a deliberate ploy. Make sure that prospective applicants knew about the culture of Netflix before they joined. And then I said, you're going to scare all our candidates because in the culture deck it says adequate performance gets a generous severance package. And he said only the ones we don't want. And the generous severance package is an important part of making this work. And it's a reaction to Patty's view that the standard management procedures, putting an employee on a performance improvement plan or a PIP for 90 days and then letting them go, was cruel and ineffective. I got rid of performance improvement plans for people that I knew we just didn't need anymore. And I had to be able to say, I love you, I do, I just don't need you anymore, man. So I'm not going to put you on a 90-day performance improvement plan. You're a terrific performer. Instead, I would say, okay, instead of us spending the next 90 days proving you're incompetent, which you aren't in writing in front of your peers, why don't I just write you a check and we can start brainstorming where you can go next? What are you going to take away and what are you going to leverage and how am I going to reference you? And, and we can be all sad about breaking up, but we can also be grown-ups about moving on. And no one was safe from this practice of tough love if they were no longer right for the team, no matter who they were. Something that would become clear in 2012. After the first transformation from DVD by mail to streaming, in 2012, Netflix was going through a second transformation from being a provider of other people's content to being a content creator. This meant the organization was transitioning from a technology company populated with engineers and coders and product managers to being an entertainment business populated with creators and content commissioners. This meant that Netflix had to hire huge swathes of new talent and in new fields, and it needed its chief talent officer to lead this process. However, Patty's background was in technology, and in Reed's view, she didn't have the right skills to take this new version of Netflix forward. Therefore, despite their decades of long friendship, Reed had the conversation with Patty, and Patty became the recipient of the generous severance package that she designed. So you might think this is an example of karma or poetic justice, but I think this is an example of Netflix's policies work. Netflix needed different skills going forward and was honest with Patty about it. Patty said herself it was difficult to hear at the time but she's gone on to have a successful post-Netflix career as a coach, as an author, and a public speaker. But a Wall Street Journal investigation has found evidence that some of these policies have gone too far, that even senior executives come to work every day, fearing they might be fired. And when a top boss heard about this, they reportedly said, good, because fear drives you. And some managers claim to have been fired because they hadn't fired enough people on their team, or they've been fired for vague reasons, like cultural fit, or no longer being a star. This means the intellectual purity of Reed and Patty's intent may have become muddied in practice, with decisions being driven by internal politicking or bias. So I don't believe Netflix is perfect. And whilst I admire their focus on performance and honesty, I also think there's room in a company's culture for kindness, for caring, for loyalty. So I wouldn't advocate copying Netflix's culture, but I would advocate copying their approach to directly and deliberately cultivating and curating an organization's culture to support its strategy. So I don't think that no rules rules, but maybe fewer rules rules.